Hey everyone, it's James with TFB TV. Today on TFB TV, we have yet another video where everyone gets pissed off at me for reviewing a gun that cost over a thousand dollars. I'm really sorry to say that today I'm reviewing the Smith & Wesson 327. You're just going to have to get past it. So why am I reviewing this gun? First of all, been a minute since I've done a straightforward missionary position review. Second, I think because of all the civil unrest and COVID and so on, I have taught more concealed handgun courses at like the tail end of the summer and the beginning of the fall than I did all of 2019. In teaching these classes, I do often see people run into issues with auto loaders, whether it's the complicated manual of arms, like too many buttons and levers, and charging and discharging the gun can be difficult. For example, you'll hand a gun to a novice, they'll put the magazine in and they'll think the gun's loaded, they'll go up to shoot and nothing will happen. If you can't count on them to know when the gun is loaded or unloaded on the range, can you really count on them to know that whenever they're in like a fight for their life, right? You have people who have difficulty racking the slide on the gun, whether it's old age or physical infirmity, there are plenty of people who are perfectly healthy, men and women both. Truly, every class I have somebody who's like, I cannot do this. But the point is, I have seen a lot of people just in the past few months where I'm thinking, listen, maybe a revolver is best for you. Maybe you need something that's simple. Maybe you need something that doesn't require a lot of physical strength or dexterity to operate. Maybe you need something where you don't have to worry about whether or not it's loaded or charged. Maybe they just need something easy. And I'll explain to them, look, here are the benefits that you're losing if you decide to go with a revolver versus an automatic. Reloads are going to tend to be slower. Your capacity is gonna be lower. You're gonna have more recoil for a similar power level. So, you know, there are a lot of things that you give up, but who cares if you can't operate the gun? Sometimes it's best maybe to get them started on a revolver. But you guys know that story. What ends up happening is they go and they buy like a uh, chief special air weight that weighs like 14 ounces and they fire 38 or 357 out of it. It'll, it'll have double action only trigger that's terrible and they can't shoot the thing worth shit. It's only got five rounds and then they get turned off the guns. Nobody wants to go to the range, especially if you're a new shooter and peel off a bunch of rounds from a five shot 38 special plus P 15 ounce gun or, or worse, something like a 340 PD and 357 Magnum that only weighs 12 ounces. So I'm thinking to myself, people are asking me, what do you think the best revolver for concealed carry is? The Smith & Wesson model 327 descended from the Smith & Wesson model 27, Smith & Wesson's original 357 Magnum revolver. At around $60 for a 357 Magnum revolver introduced during the Great Depression when the average annual salary was $1,500, it was a testament to this gun's quality that the Model 27 was functionally sold out for its first four years. Introduced in 2008, the Model 327 is the high-tech college degree holding vaping software engineer grandson of the rough, grizzled, cigar smoking, straight whiskey and bud heavy drinking retired cop Model 27. Both are 357 Magnum or 38 Special, but the 327 features a scandium alloy frame, a stainless steel barrel with a titanium cylinder and a titanium barrel shroud. This allows it to keep the weight to just around 22 ounces. By comparison, the all steel 8 shot 627 is a full pound heavier at 38 ounces almost the weight of a full steel government 1911. Speaking of 1911s, did I mention that this gun has the same eight round capacity of the classic 1911. Really amazing for a revolver when you stop and think about it. It also has a Smith & Wesson Performance Center trigger and a Performance Center tuned action. The cylinders also cut for moon clips for speed reloads. So let's talk about the specs before I hit this review. The 327 holds eight rounds of 357 Magnum or 38 SW Special Plus P. It has a barrel length of two inches and an overall length of seven inches. It's got an orange ramp front sight and a U-notch integral rear sight, AKA a gutter sight. It weighs just 22.6 ounces, which is very impressive 
for an eight round 357 Magnum of this size. The cylinder is titanium alloy. The barrel material is stainless steel with a titanium sleeve. The frame material is a scandium alloy. I've seen a lot of reports of a three and a half pound trigger pull, but mine is about four and a quarter to four and a half pounds. And it has an MSRP of, get those comment fingers ready, one thousand three fucking hundred twenty fucking four dollars and ninety nine fucking cents. And I'm going to explain to you why maybe that thirteen hundred and twenty four dollar MSRP, which equates to like maybe drop a hundred dollars off that, like a twelve twenty five street price. I've seen it thereabouts. I'm going to explain why I think that's not as bad a deal as it might sound for something that you're going to use to defend your life with. This gun is a bit of a hog. It's an end frame gun. That is, it's roughly the same size as most of Smith & Wesson's 44 Magnum revolvers. This is not a pocket gun. This is not a J frame. Here, I've got some B roll comparing this gun to the Smith & Wesson 340 PD, which is perhaps Smith & Wesson's smallest and lightest 357 Magnum revolver. And in fact, I believe the 340 PD is the smallest and lightest 357 Magnum in history. I did a full review of it earlier. I'll try to remember to drop a card right here so you guys can check that video out. You are going to carry this gun just like you would a regular semi-automatic. And in fact, I've got more B-roll for you right here. The 327 actually weighs a little bit less than my Glock 19. And dimensionally, they're very similar. In fact, I think the 327 would appear to be a lot smaller if I had the stock grips on it. Just for fun, I put the full-size square butt over-molded Hogue grips on here because it's a lot more fun to shoot that way. But I gotta say, if I were going to be concealing this on a regular basis, the wood grips are just fine. And while this gun only has a two inch barrel, you have to remember that barrel length is measured in the revolver world, excluding the chamber in the cylinder, right? While in auto loaders, that measurement typically includes the entire chamber. So if you actually put the Smith & Wesson shield barrel right next to the 327 barrel, you'll see the 327 is probably one or two tenths of an inch longer if you include the chamber. So why would I want to carry this instead of say something like the Smith & Wesson Shield, right? Which is much smaller and a third or a quarter of the price. Of course, you have to talk about reliability when you talk about revolvers. You don't have a reciprocating slide. You don't have an ejection port. Between shots, this gun doesn't need to kick spent brass out of an ejection port. So if you limp wristed it or if you fired it from say like inside of a coat pocket or something, that's a non-issue. If you have a round that fails to detonate, you don't have to tap, rack, bang a revolver. You just keep pulling the trigger. That of course is true about virtually every single revolver. So you do have the reliability factor that a lot of people like. Plus, once again, it's simple. It doesn't require a lot of physical strength to manipulate. There are not as many buttons and levers to worry about. So if you have somebody who's a novice and who doesn't want to learn the ropes of a semi-auto or they simply can't rack the slide, a revolver is pretty attractive, especially over a subcompact like the Smith & Wesson Shield, which has a slide that's really hard for a lot of people to compress. You also have a safety issue. If I'm teaching a class with say seven or eight people, there's going to be at least one or two people who say, oh, I want a gun that's got a safety. And then you worry about whether or not they can manipulate a safety, especially if it's like a slide mounted safety, much less a frame mounted safety like you'd find in a 1911. Or they say, you know what, I want a Glock, but I want to carry without one in the chamber. I'm not one of those people where I'm like, hey man, that's technically unsound new shooter who's just gonna shoot a gun for the first time today, what you're doing is not tactical. I'm not that guy. It, look, if that's the only way you're gonna carry a gun is without one in the tube, or if you want one with some kind of silly safety, or you wanna carry it around with a combination lock or whatever, I guess it's better than not having a gun. So I try not to be too hard on them, but I also explain that that's one thing I do like about revolvers. This double action trigger pull is pretty freaking heavy. I will say on the 327, for a self-defense revolver, this is about as good as it's gonna get for a double action trigger. Very impressed with it. If you feel like the shit's about to hit the fan, 
you can always go ahead and cock that hammer and then now you've got a four four and a half pound trigger to deal with so you're going to have a more accurate shot you're going to be more prepared it gives you options i feel like it's a good compromise of safety performance and simplicity and as I mentioned, this has an eight round capacity, which is really impressive for a 357 Magnum revolver. That's the same capacity as a shield, same capacity as most government 1911s, even more capacity. You're getting one more round in this thing than you would say like a Glock 42, Glock 43, or a car PM9. So the capacity is nothing to scoff at. However, I really feel like once again, you talk to revolver people, the stereotypical revolver guy, he's going to tell you about reliability and power and how the 357 Magnum can smoke any pansy mouse gun 9mm. I'm finding that not to be the case as much anymore. With advances in semi-automatic metallurgy, advances in 9mm cartridges, you're seeing 9mm rounds coming out of a 3-inch barrel, like something you'd find in a Glock 43 or a Shield. You're finding that those in 124 grain plus P or plus P plus are outperforming 125 grain rounds from a two inch snub nose 357 Magnum. But that said, 357 Magnum is still nothing to scoff at, especially eight rounds of it. And this is a controllable package, especially because you're getting a full grip on it, unlike you would with a J frame or some of the smaller K frames from Smith & Wesson. Got the Smith & Wesson 327 out here at the range. I've already dropped a couple cylinders through it. And I was actually very impressed, I would say, with how mild it shoots with 38 Special Plus P. God. 38, that's nothing. Like really no recoil whatsoever when you shoot this thing with 38. So what we're gonna do this time, I've only shot 38 Special Plus P through it. Um, we've got a 357 mag round that we're gonna drop in here. Do a little Russian roulette. I was like, I shot seven. <laughs> I shot seven of them. What are the odds? I knew I shot seven of them. I'm like, ah, shit. Here comes the, the 357. It's the only one left. It's not that bad. It is not that bad. Like, I would feel perfectly comfortable carrying and shooting this gun, you know, 38 at the range, 357 in your pants. But I would feel perfectly comfortable shooting 357 Magnum out of this thing. I thought it was going to be way worse than it is. Again, very mild shooter. As far as the shooting experience goes, the trigger's fantastic. You can actually go relatively fast, even with double action. And it isn't one of those things where it's an excruciating double action trigger pull, and then you've got it, so every time you go to the range, you're just shooting in single action. No, not at all. Um, it, it actually has a very pleasant double action trigger pull. Interestingly, Reloading a semi-automatic is typically a sizable advantage that a semi has over a revolver. All you do is hit your mag release button, mag pops out, pop a new mag in there, rack the slide, drop the slide, whatever. You're good to go with a revolver. Hit your cylinder release, pop that cylinder out, hit your ejector rod, eject all the casings, hope that they all come out, and then load them one by one, right? Not necessarily. First of all, you have the option of, say, speed strips. Speed strips are little rubbery, plasticky things. There's a company called Zeta 6. Jack Daniel, who's one of the instructors at Thunder Ranch, turned me on to them, and they make these little speed strips that are excellent. They're kind of staggered, so you can load multiple rounds at once. That's three at a time. Like, if you, if you got some practice with these, you could really jam this thing up. Funny enough, with the 327, you would actually need two of these to load it completely. But that's still not as fast as a semi-automatic. Fortunately, the 327 comes cut for moon clips. Moon clips, that is these little stamp sheet metal clips where you can go ahead and preload your rounds, dump them all into the cylinder at the same time, dump them all out at the same time. And if you're up on your internet gun knowledge, you know that Jerry Michelek shot six rounds out of Smith & Wesson 625, dumped those six spent rounds, reloaded with a moon clip, and dumped those six rounds all in under three seconds. It was like 2.99 seconds or some, something crazy, godlike, like that. 
that's a pretty fast reload. I'm not saying that you or I could do that, but what I'm saying is if you do use moon clips and you practice, you're going to be able to handle this pretty quickly, thereby diminishing the returns of a semi-automatic a little bit, especially when you're talking about an eight-round gun versus a five-round gun. You don't have to do it nearly as often. Another advantage, you can practice with 38 Special cheaply at the range, and you can carry 357. But please, for the love of God, also shoot at least a few rounds of your defensive 357 Magnum at the range to see how it performs. Please don't let the first time you shoot 357 Magnum be IRL in defense of your life. And you also have the fact that this gun weighs 22 ounces versus 25 ounces for a Glock 19. The Glock 19, considered the standard carry pistol like the Toyota Camry, of carry pistols, so this is lighter than that while being about the same size. There's a lot of advantages there. You're saying, James, I think I believe you. I think that this might be the best concealed carry revolver that you can buy if you're not looking for something for pocket carry, and yes, I am right. But you're also saying, James, you told us you were going to explain why you think $1,324 effing dollars is worth it for this hunk of metal, and I am. So bear with me. First of all, you're getting a Smith & Wesson caliber revolver, arguably the best regular production revolver that money can buy, but it's also in a 44 Magnum frame. They had to put it in an end frame really to accommodate eight rounds. If you're gonna do an inexpensive like 44 Magnum or an inexpensive 357 Magnum that's all steel, it's gonna weigh almost 40 ounces, right? So how are they gonna get the weight down while maintaining the proper integrity. Well, you're going to need space age technology from aliens, which is where Smith & Wesson got Scandium. Pretty sure of that. Double check the Wikipedia article. This gun's made out of titanium and Scandium, really expensive to machine, really expensive to procure materials that bring the weight down a full pound, which is really impressive, but that's gonna cost money. The Smith & Wesson Model 69 and 44 Magnum uses conventional materials and is the cheapest 44 Magnum from Smith & Wesson at $854. My point is, if you're cool paying $850 for a 44 Magnum, albeit a premium 44 Magnum that is the least expensive 44 Magnum that Smith & Wesson makes, then you should be cool with paying another $500 to get a gun that uses the same amount of material, right? It's an end frame also, but it's made out of scandium and titanium. It's got the Gucci trigger job. It's got the Gucci action job. It's cut for moon clips. Here, you're paying $500 for tangible benefits, and I think it's well worth it over something like, say, the Model 6944 Magnum that cost $475 less. So in conclusion, like I said, I think that this is possibly the best self-defense revolver that you can buy. If you're one of those people, if you don't trust auto loaders, if you can't use auto loaders, if you want something simple, if you want something safe, if you want something reliable, but you don't want it to weigh a ton and you're okay with carrying this either on your purse or on body rather than in a pocket, I can't think of another gun that would be better as a revolver than the 327. It's controllable, even with 357 Magnum rounds, eight shots. Ryan and I, we both enjoyed shooting it in 357 or 38. Special mag mix. We got eight rounds 357 Magnum, eight rounds 38 Special. Here, shake them up, shake them up, shake them up, and then put eight in your pocket. Looking rough. Give that, yeah, give that cylinder a nice spin. Now let's get out there. My camera guy, Ryan, and I were playing a little game at the range where we were using random batches of 357 and 38 all mixed together in the same cylinder and trying to figure out which one was which under rapid fire. And I gotta tell you, it was actually relatively difficult to tell with the Model 327. So that was impressive. What do you think? I dig it. Pretty cool, eight shot, 357. Eight rounds of 357, cut for moon clips, lightweight, concealable. Yeah, it's expensive, but I think I explained why I think it's still worth the money. Possibly the best concealed carry self-defense revolver you can get. But let's talk about the negatives because we always do that with TFB TV reviews. 
first, the sights leave something to be desired. They're not the worst, but you have gutter sights in the back, which is okay, especially if you're going to be concealed carrying this thing. You don't want this rear sight to get snagged on your clothes. So that's not too bad. And you've got like a front orange blade. I would much prefer to see like that fiber optic front sight you see in the 340 PD if you're going to go with the gutter sights on the back. It would just be nicer. Some people also complain about the length of the ejector rod. As you can see, it's really short, and so it won't completely clear the case length of a 357 Magnum whenever you hit it. We didn't really have a problem with it, though. Because this is a little bit of a weird gun, it might be difficult to get inside the waistband or like your high speed low drag holsters you might be looking for, but many of you may not be looking for that. And remember, it does share a pretty common frame size, so there are plenty of holster options out there for it. Not a huge knock against this gun. I feel like they could have made a three inch barrel model. This isn't a gun that you're going to be carrying in your pocket. This isn't a backup gun or an ankle gun. This gun is large enough that you're going to have to carry it either in your purse, in a satchel, on your body. And so especially if you're carrying it on body, that extra inch is just going to vanish down your pants. Wow. What I'm trying to say is it wouldn't have really hurt the dimensions of this gun or the concealability of this gun if you're carrying it barreled down or in a bag or something. It wouldn't have hurt to add that extra inch. Now, a lot of people think this rule of thumb where typically you add an inch of barrel to a handgun, you're going to get about an extra 50 feet per second. Not quite the case when you're jumping from two inch to three inch barrels because this gun's still burning powder at the two inch to three inch level. When you go from two inches to a three inch barrel, you're talking about a 10 to 20% increase in velocity and therefore a 10 to 20% increase in power. I think I'd take the extra inch and the extra ounce and go with a three inch barrel and the additional power. Really my chief complaint about the 327 would be my chief complaint about every single other revolver ever. That is that they're slow to reload and they're inefficient. However, what the 327 has done is they bridge the gap with some of those inefficiencies. You've got more capacity, you've got faster reloading in that it's cut for moon clips, it's lightweight, and it'll pack plenty of power with 357 Magnum while maintaining a very good trigger and a degree of controllability. Guys, thanks a ton for watching. If you like this review, please subscribe. It helps us more than you can imagine. But if you wanna help us more than that, if you really like us, check us out on Patreon or Subscribestar. We do giveaways, we give away four guns, every month we give away three $100 gift certificates to blue alpha belts. It's awesome. And you get a lot of exclusive content. We have to mention that our giveaways are in no way associated or affiliated with or endorsed by or whatever YouTube. Nothing to do with YouTube. It's all on us. Thank you to our sponsors, Blue Alpha, Ventura Munitions, and Top Gun Supply, your online shooting sports superstore. Feel free to check them out. Support us through supporting them. But thanks as usual just for watching, guys. I'm out of here. Take care.